Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Kale's webinar, PLA, Overview and Examples. This is session one. Uh, the next session will be held next Tuesday, February 22nd. Uh, for those of you just joining us, welcome. You should uh, be hearing our audio right now. And just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, for those that haven't called in, hopefully they're reading this information to go ahead and call in. So um, everything should be ready to go on that. One thing we would like to point out is that all of you have been unmuted as you've called in, um, so we can have a discussion later on. But if you can please mute your phones, and, um, unless it's a designated Q&A uh, &A session, just because if there's any background dialogue or uh, paper rustling, anything like that, everyone on the webinar will be able to hear that. So we just ask that you please mute your phones until the designated Q&A times. Um, on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see the discussion area box. If you have any questions during the presentations, uh, feel free to jot them down or go ahead and type them into the discussion area. And that way, when we do get to the question and answer times, we can go ahead and go back through and answer those for you, or you can feel free to just ask those verbally to our presenters. And a last item to note is that we are recording the webinar, both the slides and the audio. So you will be receiving a link to um, view the webinar if you choose to do so in the next day or two following the webinar. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Diana Bamford-Reese. Thank you very much, Tracy, and welcome, everyone. We're delighted to have you with us today for part one of this two-part webinar, Prior Learning Assessment Overview and Examples. I am Diana Bamford-Reese, Associate Vice President at Kale. And with us today, we have also Judy Wertheim, our Vice President for Higher Education Services at Kale. Uh, welcome, Judy. And uh, we have with us two individuals from uh, their institutions, experts in prior learning assessment, um, Jerry Merwin and Susan Gunn. And it's my, opportun my uh, pleasure uh, to take this opportunity to inter say a little bit more about Jerry and Susan and their background. Jerry Merwin is Associate Professor and Director of Adult Degree Completion and Military Programs at Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. Jerry serves on the Advisory Board for LearningCounts.org, Hale's Virtual Prior Learning Assessment Center. He was involved in establishing the Adult Learning Consortium, the ALC, which now consists of nine institutions in the university system of Georgia. As a member of the ALC Executive Committee, he is involved with guiding the development of PLA offerings, including a network of faculty assessors within the consortium. Jerry is currently working with others at Valdosta State to develop templates for online evaluations that will allow students to be evaluated by faculty assessors from any of the nine ALC institutions. He has been a presenter at several CALE conferences and has shared the story of the development of PLA at Valdosta State University and the formation of the University System of Georgia Adult Learning Consortium. And we're delighted to have you with us today, Jerry. Thank you. Um, let me tell you a bit about Dr. Susan Gunn. Susan is an Associate Professor of English at St. Edwards University, and she has directed the Center for Prior Learning Assessment there since 2000. Susan is a 1991 graduate of St. Edward's New College Program for Adult Learners, and she earned substantial credit toward her own degree through the portfolio process. She also holds the MA from Texas State and a PhD from Kent State University. Susan is an accomplished singer, and she remains an active, lifelong learner through private vocal study in Austin, Texas. We're very fortunate to have and Susan and Jerry, two such knowledgeable individuals with us to share their vast experience of PLA. Um, now, I would like to begin our webinar this afternoon first with a definition of PLA, which will be followed by a brief history of CALE and, and prior learning assessment. We'll then look at four approaches to prior learning, and the final approach is the portfolio 
about which Jerry and Susan will have much to share in the second hour of today's session. Judy Wertheim will share data from several national research studies, and Judy will also discuss the gap in the U.S. and the importance of reaching out to adult learners to close this gap. Judy will address the role that prior learning assessment plays in this process. In the second hour, Jerry and Susan will share two institutional models for portfolio prior learning. Judy, Jerry and Susan are both um, editors of chapters in the portfolio book, which is the text for this webinar, and that book's been sent to you. Um, if you registered just within the last few days, of course, you may not have the book yet, but um, it will be coming, and uh, you will need it for the reading assignment before the next week. Now, as for a definition for prior learning assessment, there are, there are many different definitions, but this is the one that will put us all on the same page. It's the one that we use at Kale. Um, we, the prior learning assessment is the evaluation for college credit of the knowledge and skills one gains from life experiences or from non-college instructional programs. And this includes learning from employment, travel, hobbies, civic activities, and volunteer service, any of the above. A little bit about Kale's history with prior learning assessment. Um, Kale began as a research project housed at ETS in Princeton, New Jersey back in 1974. The project was a three-year initiative funded by the Car uh, Carnegie Corporation. Um, and it was around the question of is it possible to do valid and reliable assessment of non-college learning for college credit? Um, more than 200 institutions, more than 250 institutions joined with Kale in this project in the first three years. 50 of, of them received some seed grants to serve as um, research sites for the project. And at the end of the three-year project, the network of institutions involved wanted to continue and have a forum to do the work that they were doing around prior learning assessment. And so Kale, um, at the end of the ETS project, incorporated as a nonprofit higher education organization of 501c3. Um, a, a landmark um, event in 1979 for Kale was that Three associations, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, the American Council on Education, and the Council on Higher Education Accreditation all endorsed Hale's prior learning assessment principles, or what we were calling at the time the principles um, of good practice in prior learning assessment. In, 1980s, in the 1980s, we published two books which are still in use today in revised editions. The Earn College Credit for What You Know book that is directed uh, at the adult learner, him or herself, and the a book for staff and faculty who are in the process of prior learning assessment, the Assessing Learning Standards, Principles, and Procedures. And you'll hear us reference this um, Frequently throughout the webinar, this is where the 10 standards for quality assurance are set forth in the book, uh, Assessing Learning Standards, Principles, and Procedures. In 1996, Kale conducted a major national survey of PLA practices, and, that, and we had over 1,300 institutions responding to that survey. The results were published uh, in 1999 in a book called Prior Learning Assessment, a Guidebook to American Institutional Practices. In the 2000s, you see a lot of activity around prior learning assessment and, and Kale's work. Um, in, in the year 2000, in conjunction with DePaul or partnership with DePaul University, Kale developed a online certificate program for prior learning assessment assessors. 
Um, that, that program is still very active today. It's offered several times each year, and there's information about it available on CALE's website. In the year 2001, the three uh, major associations, which I mentioned earlier, reissued their endorsement of the CALE principles. In the year 2006, both the Earn College Credit for What You Know book and the Assessing Learning um, Standards, Principles, and Pro Procedures books were published again, revised, and brought up to date. It's the fourth edition of the Earn College Credit book and the second edition of the Assessing Learning book. In 2006, Kale conducted another national survey of PLA policies and practices and you'll hear us reference that further in the webinar as well. 2009 was the publication of prior learning assessment portfolios, a representative collection, and that's the book that's the text for this webinar. In 2009, Hale conducted a multi-institutional research study, which led to the publication of the report, Schooling the Race, and Judy Wertheim will be talking more about that later. Um, in 2010, we conducted a study of prior learning assessment practices in the community colleges. And in 2010, just a few months ago, the learningcounts.org um, was launched, and that is Hale's Virtual Prior Learning Assessment Center. Now let's look at um, four approaches to prior learning assessment, and we'll drill down a bit on each of these. The first is to look at standardized exams. Next, we'll look at challenge exams. The ACE evaluated non-college programs, programs for both military and uh, corporate programs. And then we'll talk a bit about individualized assessment, which will be the focus of the presentations which um, Jerry and Susan will make, and this is uh, when we talk about individualized assessments, we're saying portfolio. Types of standardized exams. We have the advanced placement exams, the college level examination program, or the CLEP test, Excelsior college exams, and the DSST. Um, I mentioned earlier the 2006 National Survey. The statistics which will be used in the following slides come from that survey. The advanced placement exams. There are 34 examinations in 19 subject areas, and they are frequently administered to high school students who have taken advanced placement courses. They are administered by the college board, and 84% of the institutions surveyed in our 2006 survey uh, use advanced placement exams as one of their methods for prior learning assessment. The college level examination program or the CLEP test, 34 tests of, of 101 level material. It can be three to 12 credits for each exam taken. There have been 5 million users since the program launched in 1967. And in our 2006 survey, 87% of the institutions reported using CLEP tests. Excelsior College exams are also known as the Regents College or the ACT PEP exams. They're proficiency-based exams. There are 40 of them in many different areas. They're administered by Excelsior College in New York, and 28% get a national service. Excuse me, could you please mute the phone background? Please mute the phone. It uh, <clears throat> sounds like somebody put um, put us on hold, and we're getting their hold music, unfortunately. So we'll be back soon. Yep. Um, the DSST, or the Defense Activity for Non-Traditional Support, Dante, military. It is available to There are nearly three exams in the area. Test 
by the international survey. And pretty eight percent uh national survey a yes exam. Challenge exams are exams of local courses. Um they're used at institutional discretion. They are locally developed tests that um, the, the professors who teach the course have developed. They may and frequently are the final exams for the course. And 57 cents survey, they challenge exams as for a pretty different process. Then you may be familiar with the American Council on Education or the ACE National Guide. Uh, we had a press for hundreds of organizations both both trying to act still. Um, Seventy percent within the national survey use the ACE guides. Now the guides, uh, which used to be just big thick books, are all available electronically now, and I'll be giving you the URL for where you can find the guides as well as some of the other testing organizations. So the next slides, I'm going to very quickly, they are just here in the rest that you have web address. Uh, get the recording, we'll be getting copies of these slides. And um, so these are here for the AP and the class web addresses the DSST and Excelsior College exam web addresses, uh, an example of one challenge exam from Ohio University, and the ACE addresses for both the military guides and the corporate training program guides. The, the fourth, um, fourth method for or approach for doing prior learning assessment is what I would approach for your portfolio process. It's six steps. Um, the two Excuse me, Diana? Yes? Diana? This is Bess. We're um, having some trouble with the audio because somebody uh, has put us on hold. Um, I was just uh, thinking we could contact an operator and put everyone on mute. Unfortunately, we don't know who yes, the person I think we is who has, who has their phone on hold. So maybe you just want to wait a minute and we can I get will. an operator. All right. Thank you. All right. Sorry, everyone. Uh, they're going to go ahead and manually mute all of our participants, so uh, okay. you should be good to go to proceed. Thank Sorry you very about much. We do Sorry about that, everyone. Yes, our apologies. Um, but um, And I know it was very difficult to hear what I was saying. This will be in the slides that you receive. So, um, again, you'll have all those URLs, and you can go to the website. Uh, now, I was speaking about individualized assessments or the portfolio process. 
66% in the survey in 2006 uh, indicated that they use the portfolio process, and this is up from our survey 10 years earlier where the percentage was 56%. So the portfolio process, even though um, very individualized and somewhat labor intensive, has uh, proven to be um, very effective and is being used with greater frequency um, now than it has been previously. Okay, <laughs> um, so we have quiet, and I'm sorry that we've had to mute you, but um, now is a time for questions, so you can type questions in uh, if you'd like, and, um, you know, we will have several other points throughout the webinar this afternoon where you can ask your questions. So um, we'll give you just a minute to see if anything comes up, and if not, we will proceed, and you can ask questions at a later point. Okay, uh, this is Judy Wertheim. Uh, thank you very much, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you, everybody, for bearing with us while we had that um, interruption. Uh, I think that uh, the best thing that we can do is to continue and um, to type questions in rather than um, relying on unmuting everybody because we may be back to the same problem. There is a question, and we've been asked whether uh, credit from the American Council on, a on Education, ACE credit, is still considered prior learning assessment. Yes, it is. It is um, because um, ACE credit looks at both military and corporate training. They make credit recommendations best, based on the courses. Those credit recommendations are recorded in both the ACE guide, which you can see online, and uh, the credit is also recorded on an ACE transcript uh, because this is credit for learning that has occurred outside the college classroom but has been evaluated for college level credit. That is one of the areas that's considered PLA credit. Um, I would just like to say that um, one of the things that you've probably noticed in Diana's presentation is that prior learning assessment formally has been around since uh, the mid-1970s. Uh, we are now nearly 40 years later. And still, we are uh, talking about training people to do prior learning assessments. Even though there are many institutions that do accept prior learning assessment in one form or another, there are other institutions that still have not um, gotten on the bandwagon about prior learning assessment. We also know that there are some institutions that accept one form of prior learning assessment but not another. And we also know that there are institutions that accept prior learning assessment credits in some areas but not in all areas. And one of the things that um, we hope you uh, learn today is how prior learning assessment can be used or expanded at your own institution. And I would like to talk about some reasons, uh, additional reasons for expanding prior learning assessment opportunities. Um, one of the things that Kale did with support from Lumina Foundation for Education was to conduct research in 2008 on adult learners throughout the country. This is a national study. Um, we conducted it in partnership with NCHEMS, the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, which is based in Colorado. And you can access this study on our website. Let me just take a minute to talk to you about our website. I think that if you haven't looked through it, um, you might find some very interesting information there. Um, it's easy to access, www.kale.org. And as you um, get the home page, you'll see a list of areas that Kale focuses in. And I think that if you click on to higher education, you'll see a lot of information that you might find very helpful. In addition, if you click on to the Publications tab, 
which is on uh, the menu on the top of the page. You will um, find out about some of Kale's publications which are available for purchase. But more than that, you will also see some white papers and some studies that Kale has posted on our website. And um, I think particularly for those of you who are becoming familiar with adult learning and perhaps becoming familiar with PLA, you might find those um, publications um, very helpful. Um, this study that we did um, in conjunction with NCHEMS did not involve any original research. We did not conduct any studies. Instead, we looked at the data that were already available in the country but hadn't been collected in one single uh, resource prior to our uh, study. We thought that we would have a monograph of about 50 pages. What we finally uh, produced is a monograph that is 76 pages long. So there was a lot more information available from a lot more sources than we had um, and originally anticipated. We looked at individual state measures on our variables. We uh, compared those to one another, and then we also compared them to the national average. There are state-by-state -state profiles, and there is also a policy framework. Um, all of this is available on the website. For example, if you go to the website, you will find the full uh, monograph. Uh, that is available. You also, if you go to the website, will find um, the, uh, the state profiles. All you need to do is look at a map of the United States, click onto your state, and you will see a two-page summary of how your state is performing in serving adult learners. What you also can do is drill down and find much more specific information from the NCHEMS databases. Um, we also have the policy framework uh, that not only includes some ideas for policy, but also gives you specific example of what's happening in various states, and that may help you. And finally, there is an annotated bibliography. So there is a lot of information, and the way to find this is to look at the Kale drop-down menu. And because the name of the publication is Adult Learning in Focus, it's the first thing that you will see, and all you need to do is to click onto it to get to the various um, items that I just mentioned. Um, then we um, also want to emphasize that um, the reason for our undertaking this study in the first place was that we um, had, like you, heard the strong argument for higher education attainment in the United States, and we also have heard that jobs are expected to um, increase in their demand for a skilled workforce in the coming years. What we found in our research was uh, something that um, supported these arguments. In addition to that, um, as I mentioned, our study was published in 2008, but there is additional support for the importance of education in the United States. Certainly, we've heard this from President Obama. We have heard it from various um, nonprofit groups in addition to CALE. And as recently as uh, June of 2010, a report published by the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce indicated that there will be a shortage of nearly 8 million trained people to fill the jobs that will be available in the future. And remember, please, I said trained people. Uh, one of the things that we need to remember is that we're interested in education and training people to fill these jobs using both new skills and also um, transforming the skills that they have learned in the past. However, a significant proportion of the adult population has never taken a single class toward a degree, and many have only a high school diploma or less. Um, 
other nations are overtaking the United States. We are no longer the leader in education. Uh, other nations have caught up with us. And one of the charts that we present in uh, this study shows that the United States in this study has become 10th in the world. There is uh, some more recent um, uh, data that shows the United States has become 11th. Whichever way you look at it, we are no longer the leader in an educated workforce in the world. In other words, we're no longer as economically competitive as we once were. And uh, I'm going to toggle back and forth between slides because the next slide indicates that as baby boomers retire from current jobs, um, there is a skills gap. And if we go back to the slide I just showed you, what you will see if you look at the United States, which is the farthest um, group of um, bars on the right, you will see that in the United States we have the lowest proportion of adults aged 25 to 34 with an associate's or higher degree. Uh, who will fill the jobs that are left by the baby boomers? Uh, it looks as though our young adults will not be able to meet that need as things now stand. Further complicating things, there are only nine states that will uh, remain economically competitive. In other words, they will have 55% of their adults with a college degree by the year 2025. Uh, uh, this is not a, always a universally accepted goal. For example, Lumina Foundation for Education has what it is naming its big goal and has supported many um, initiatives to achieve the big goal. In other words, helping increase the number of college degrees that are held in this country. Their big goal is even higher than the one that you see on this slide. Their big goal is 60% of um, citizens will have a post-secondary degree by the year 2025. In any case, these are ambitious goals, and unless we do something different from what we have been doing, we are not going to meet them. Oh, as I said, only nine states can meet the benchmark if they match the performance of the best performing states. There are 32 states that will be unable to meet this goal if they focus on traditional age students, 18 to 22 years old, and if they continue either to do what they're doing or match the performance of the best states. And these are the states. Um, you might want to look for yours. Uh, you can see that the largest gap will be in Texas, the smallest gap in Indiana, but you might find your own state here among the states that will not be able to meet the goal of becoming economically competitive. Um, I do know that you probably will get your nose smudged on the screen looking at the slides, but you will be able to see it uh, larger when we send you the slides and you're able to, um, if you'd like, print this out. Um, well, so uh, clearly, as I um, emphasized, we will not be able to meet the goal if we focus on uh, the traditional age student. Instead, there are other sources that we have to tap to rectify the shortfall. And um, there are varying ways of estimating the numbers. Um, the ones we have chosen are um, 21 million adults who have never completed high school. There are also 46 million who have high school diplomas but no college. And there are 32 million who have some college but no degree. There are other estimates that um, increase this last number that identify more than 32 million adults with some college but no degree. 
There are many states that already have initiatives to reach out with those, but with some college, but no degree. Uh, as you uh, in your own state may know, there are programs that have identified individuals in the state with some college, but no degree. There are states that have specific programs to reach out to adults with some college but no degree. There are also individual institutions that have reached out to adults with some college but no degree. One of the states that has done that is Kentucky. And Kentucky's program um, is the Kentucky Adult Learner Initiative, K-A-L-I. They also have a Double the Numbers campaign to double the number of people who hold a post-secondary degree. Uh, when this campaign was launched a few years ago, Kentucky conducted a telephone survey of adults um, at, to ask them, what would it take for you to be influenced to go back to college and complete your degree? And the three areas that adults identified were flexible academic programs, financial aid, and the opportunity to earn credit for prior learning. Prior learning assessment is a huge motivator in um, encouraging adults to go back to school. Adults uh, like to um, uh, use the knowledge that they have acquired so that they are able to accelerate their progress toward a degree and complete that degree. There are many adults who are only a few credits away from having earned a degree, and for one reason or another, they stopped before they had completed. Nonetheless, they did not stop learning when they left the um, academic institution. They continued to learn, very often learning material that could be evaluated for college level credit. And that's really important to remember. I think that all of the presenters will say time and time again, what we're talking about is learning that is equivalent to college level learning. We are not talking about learning uh, that is not documented nor learning that is not at the college level. When we did the study, when we looked at uh, adult learning in the United States, one of the things that we determined was that there were factors that affect adult participation. Uh, adults, as we said when I talked to you about the uh, research that had been done with the phone study in Kentucky, is that uh, one of the factors that prevents adults from going back to school is affordability. Adults would like financial aid of some sort. Um, one of the things that Kale has done is to look at some of the factors that lead to retention and graduation of adult learners. We've done this with um, our ALFI toolkit, the Adult Learner Focused Institution Toolkit. And one of the uh, essential principles for serving adult learners is looking at the financial arrangements that are made. This is not only financial aid, but for example, it includes um, tuition assistance that's provided by an employer. When is this tuition assistance provided? Very often employers provide the assistance only after the class is successfully completed. Institutions, however, would like to be paid when students register. And so one of the things that institutions that successfully serve adult learners uh, might consider are flexible ways of uh, having students pay for the credits that they are earning. Another, um, uh, another impediment to adults returning to school is accessibility. How accessible is the institution? How accessible are the programs? How accessible is the knowledge that they will be learning at the institution? And finally, uh, another uh, barrier is aspiration. Very often, as you probably know, the students who have um, 
who have stopped going to school, those who have some college but no degree, stopped going to school because they were asked to stop. Not everybody who stopped had been successful in their first experience or even their second or third experience at an institution. And so they are very often they've given up hope of completing a degree. Therefore, um, as, aspiration is uh, an important category that individuals uh, uh, have uh, as a barrier in returning to school. We believe that prior learning assessment in any of the forms that Diana mentioned earlier in this presentation addresses all of those uh, barriers. In terms of affordability, you will see when you look at the book, Prior Learning Portfolios, a representative collection, that for each institution there are some common questions that are addressed. And one is the cost of prior learning assessment. By and large, the cost is less than taking that same class and paying the tuition. Uh, what we find is that um, this is a cost-effective measure for students to, um, uh, to complete a college credit and to move forward in their degree. And I hope you come back next week, and I'm going to talk to you about the advantage for the institution. Uh, the institution, I will uh, explain to you, does not lose money because the student is paying less um, for the prior learning assessment. But um, I hope I can keep the suspense and have you return next week to find out why. Uh, in addition, uh, if students um, are paying a lower tuition and earning the credit, they then don't have as many classes for which they need to pay the full tuition. So on many levels, uh, prior learning assessment um, in, uh, increases the affordability of the institution. Accessibility. Uh, when I spoke about accessibility, I mentioned the accessibility of the knowledge. Because students are able to demonstrate uh, knowledge that they already have, knowledge that they already know, they are able to demonstrate to others and to themselves that college level knowledge and the college level work is accessible to them. They are able to succeed at college level work. Um, and finally, aspiration. Um, we talked about students who had stopped going to school because they were not successful. Not everybody who has some college but no degree uh, was successful there um, in, in their previous um, life as a student. Um, prior learning assessment helps renew their aspiration. It confirms that, yes, indeed, they can complete college level work. In addition, there are many people who have not had college level experience. They are uh, those millions of people I identified earlier who have a high school diploma but no college experience. They too are inspired um, to raise their level of aspiration when they see that uh, they are able to do college level work. There are many institutions we found in a survey that we did um, with institutions in the state of Pennsylvania. There are many different practices of when students can apply for a, poly a college level of credit through prior learning assessment. Uh, there are some institutions that say you must do it immediately upon entering. There are other institutions that say you must have 12 successful credit hours before you may apply for prior learning assessment. There are yet other institutions that have other practices and have other times when students might apply. But there are some institutions that do this very early in a student's career at the institution. And one of the things that this accomplishes is to show the students that, yes, they can succeed at college level work and that they are capable of performing at the college level. Okay. Um, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation, uh, talking about not only some of the advantages of prior learning assessment, but also some of the data that points to the uh, need for educating adults 
and um, having them move forward in their academic careers. And um, now we have some time for questions. And uh, there is one question. Uh, do uh, we have any knowledge of any institutions granting international students credit for prior learning? There are two ways that this can happen. One is uh, for um, the admissions office that looks at transcripts to look at transcripts, and there are organizations in the United States that look at international transcripts and make uh, equivalencies so that um, this would be considered transfer credit as other credit is considered transfer credit. And yet another way of having international students earn credit for their prior learning uh, can be to have them do any of the other things that we talked about with prior learning. For example, um, there may be tests that they can take. For example, one of the tests, uh, the CLEP test, that has the most students um, who are taking the test are Spanish tests, so that there are foreign language tests that international students may complete. There are also international corporations. It may be altogether possible that the American Council on Education has reviewed international training programs that are listed uh, in their guide. Uh, there also may be specific uh, challenge exams at the particular institution that the student is enrolled in that may be um, given to the student. And finally, there is the individual portfolio in which the student can demonstrate learning that has taken place any place in the world, not necessarily only in the United States. Um, and then we have another comment. Uh, that is a comment rather than a question, and it's another suggestion that deferred payment plans may be a way to address uh, student um, finances and the affordability of courses. And yes, there are some institutions that, that do that. There are deferred payment plans that can help the student um, space the, uh, the payment of tuition. Are there any other questions that you would like to type in? Okay, um, please feel free to do this in uh, the future, and um, I think that um, I well, I think this is working well. I, I do apologize for your not being able to talk, but I think all of us will agree um, it's nice not to have the background music that we had originally. I now gives me great pleasure to introduce. Uh, Jerry Merwin, who is the Director of the Adult Degree Completion and Military Programs at Valdosta State University. And I would just like to say that um, the reasons that Jerry and Susan have been invited to present um, in our um, webinar is that uh, not only do they represent programs that have been very successful, not only will they give you some very specific suggestions and talk to you about their own programs, but they are also representing a variety of approaches to prior learning assessment. Some programs um, have been, as I mentioned, um, in existence since the mid-70s. Some are brand new. I think that you'll get a variety of perspectives from what Jerry and Susan have to say to you, and it gives me great pleasure again to introduce Jerry Merwin. Thank you, Judy. I'm pleased to be with you today and to work with you and Diana and Susan in talking about prior learning assessment. It's a topic I enjoy talking about. I'm going to give the group a little bit of an overview about Valdosta State and then go on to our specifics about the PLA program. We are located in the South Central part of the state, and we are also part of the University System of Georgia. We are one of the regional uh, campuses, and so we cover the uh, southern territory in the state. Um, we have a population of about 13,000 students, roughly 10,000 undergraduate and 3,000 graduate. Um, we have three off-campus locations. Moody Air Force Base, Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base, and the Albany Marine Corps Logistics Facility. Uh, our region is the 41 county region in the, the center, excuse me, from uh, South Georgia from Alabama border to the Atlantic Ocean. And we have Can you 
hear me better now? I see someone. Uh, yes, I, I, I can hear you, Jerry. Couldn't for a while here. I'm sorry about that. I'll try and speak more clearly. Uh, we begin with associate degrees and work through doctoral programs. Our institution was the site for a pilot project in 2008 for the University System of Georgia to try prior learning assessment. And uh, from that initial project has grown the Adult Learning Consortium. Uh, here at VSU, we've had 28 students earn credit for a total of 79 courses and 292 semester hours since we started in 2008. The courses, departments, programs that we have primarily seen credit awarded include American Sign Language in the College of Education, uh, criminal justice, nursing, and a core area called perspectives. Our program is based on a course match where we have to try and identify a specific course that matches up with what the student has learned. And so we've got a number of areas of content that relate to the prior learning assessment that I've listed here. And we use various assessment methods. Each department and program uh, determines which courses are available by prior learning assessment. And the faculty assessors determine the specific methods that we use for the assessment. This is the flow chart that we created for the book on the portfolio methods. And it is roughly the same process that we use today. Um, as I think Judy mentioned earlier, trying to look at the, the graph with this flow chart, you might not be able to read everything in, in the small print. But if you have the book, you'll be able to see the, the flow chart there and also the um, Slides will have a better representation of it for you to see later when you get those. One of the questions that comes up often is the fee structure and the way the fees are dispersed. Um, we actually are doing something different from what was being done when the book was written a couple of years ago. Um, we have a prior learning assessment course, PLA 2000, that's a two credit hour course. The tuition at Valdosta State this year is $189 per credit hour for a total of $378. Um, the credits for the portfolio evaluation um, are, of course, only awarded if, if they are approved by the evaluator or faculty assessor. But the evaluation fees are listed here with a beginning point of one credit course being 150 up to a four credit or above course being 275. Um, the money is distributed with part of it going to the faculty assessor who does the evaluation, uh, $25 for administrative overhead, and 25 to cover the cost of the PLA advisor. And we found. So far, that looks like a, a pretty workable approach. Uh, we originally were doing $50 for an assessment as a flat fee. And that was based on what we had had previously, which was a, a departmental exam at $50. And we knew that that wouldn't be something that would be sustainable to operate the program in the long term. So that was why we decided to revisit this. And this fee structure actually was developed by the institutions involved in the Adult Learning Consortium so that we've been able to um, come up with an agreement that, that seems to fit. And to compare the way that would work versus what it would cost for tuition, as Judy mentioned, of affordability being a factor, um, the actual tuition for a VSU course is $154 for a, a course that's face-to-face -face or on campus and $189 for online courses. The process, once the student is evaluated, is the faculty assessor can recommend credit. That recommendation goes to the department head 
and then the dean of the college, and finally to the provost and vice president of academic affairs. And that's where the final credit approval occurs. And after that point, the transcripting is done in the registrar's office. What I've suggested for the next session is that individuals would review the chapter that we have on Valdosta State University and look at the two sample portfolios, um, see what you think about the way those portfolios are done. Would you uh, consider giving credit to an individual who submitted those portfolios if they were on your campus and you had a course that matched up with those? And if you have any feedback for us or questions, from the chapter, we're open to having those come up at the next session. And finally, to wrap up this section, let me know if you have any questions now. Um, Jerry, this is Judy. Um, I, I do have some questions, um, and um, I, um, I may... Um, well, I'll take advantage of having the mic, but I do hope that others um, will have some questions. And um, I uh, would like to know, how did you convince the faculty at Valdosta um, to accept prior learning assessment, particularly the portfolio process? Well, that's a good question because it wasn't necessarily something that people welcomed immediately. Um, there's a, a little bit of history in the story that we tell when we've done the presentations at Cale, but I wasn't sure how much time we'd have here. But since we've got a, a little bit of time, I'll explain that there was actually a program about 20 years ago that had started here at VSU, and people were able to earn credit through an evaluation process, but there were questions at the time about the consistency of the process and how the credits were awarded. And I think a lot of faculty members were suspicious that it was not necessarily based on college-level learning. So that program had been dismantled, and I guess eight or, or ten years had passed in between when we brought up the, the prior learning assessment program. Uh, we had to go through a, a fairly lengthy process of developing both policies and procedures that would be acceptable to everyone here. Uh, we enlisted the help of um, consultants and did training for faculty. We did use the uh, DePaul and Kale online workshops and had about a dozen people initially trained through those, and we have some more people who will be going through that soon. And through that training, and I think people began to, to gain an appreciation for the process, that it is college-level learning and it is a process of assessment. It's just not just granting credit for experience. Um, we sold key faculty members throughout the institution, and they then went back to their own areas, their departments and their programs and colleges, and we, we asked which areas would be open to doing prior learning assessment. And so those departments and programs uh, were the ones involved first with this. Um, it has been very successful. We've had uh, a general level of satisfaction that I believe everybody recognizes this as an appropriate approach. We went through our SACS reaffirmation for our accreditation this past year, and the record, I think, for, for what we've heard in, in many places was that we had no recommendations as a result of that. And so prior learning assessment was part of the package that was approved in that review. Um, so we're, we're evidently doing what everybody thinks we should be doing, and, and it's going well. Thank you. Um, we, we do have uh, some questions, um, and you probably can see them too, uh, but let, let me just um, say them out loud. Um, one of the questions is, does a prior learning assessment count towards a residency requirement? That's a good question, and, and that comes up often. We are taking it that because the students are being evaluated by the faculty at our institution, that it is part of the residency, so that we're, we're 
treating this as if the, the student took the course here at VSU. So that, that has been accepted as a way to, to manage the prior learning assessment. Um, I guess there could still be debates about that within certain uh, areas. And it is, again, as I mentioned earlier, pretty much everything we do is up to the department and the program. So some departments or programs might have a, a specific policy about that. But for the most part, we are counting it as uh, credit towards the residency requirement. Thank you. Uh, this is Judy. I would just like to add something. In Kale's work with institutions uh, that are using prior learning assessment, particularly those that are either starting programs or reviving programs, there are many institutions that have prior learning assessment somewhere on the books, but nobody has done prior learning assessment for years and years and years. Um, institutions need to uh, develop a set of principles and practices that are clear, that are available to everyone, and that are consistent with the institution's mission. Um, Jerry just said that um, the portfolio does apply as residency credit at his institution. This, as he said too, is not uniform, and there are some institutions that do not follow that practice, but they have good reason for doing it. And um, one of the things that you will see in the book that you received is that the there are um, a lot of areas that institutions address when they are determining prior learning assessment principles and practices that um, they, they need to agree on. Um, and also, as Jerry mentioned in his presentation, uh, the practices change. Uh, he talked about the fee structure, which changed from the initiation to uh, what it currently is. And I think that that's one of the things that everybody involved in prior learning assessment needs to be aware of, that the decisions you make initially may change, and those decisions may also change. And that's part of what it means to have a program that is evolving and growing and responding to the needs of both the institution and, and the students. Um, we have another question. Well, actually, Jerry, we have several more questions. So take a deep breath. And here's one question. Uh, do, you have a do you have a crosswalk for technical courses where the curriculum committee has already agreed on what competencies must be covered? Um, let me answer what I think might be the question, and then we can clarify if, if not. Um, I'm taking technical courses in this case to mean courses from technical colleges. Um, and let me explain that we've got a specific degree program that is established specifically for students who transfer from two-year colleges. And they can actually earn credit at the junior level for the, the technical learning that they bring with them so that that's part of their um, upper division. And then they do additional work in the core that they might not have taken at their technical college. Um, Thank you. Um, that uh, sounds to me like it's an articulation agreement that has been developed for transfer credit and then a student coming in. Is that correct? Correct. And that's okay. true with, with all the, the technical colleges in the um, in the state of Georgia. We've got a technical college system of Georgia, so that is a, an established agreement with those institutions. And that's part of why I took that as, as crosswalk. That's pretty much how we're using that. If we're talking about technical courses within the SU, there are some variations that different departments do different things. OK. May I ask you about one technical program? Um, I, uh, I see that courses and departments that grant credit for prior learning assessment include nursing. Correct. And that is not universal. And so I wonder if you could go into a little more detail about what happens with prior learning assessment for nursing at VSU. I'd like to because that is a, a special program. And, and I guess that's going to end up covering two of these categories. One in that a lot of the students who come to us 
have an associate's degree in nursing from a two-year institution, and that might be either a technical college or a community college that grants an associate degree in nursing, uh, those individuals who have the ADN or associate degree in nursing and five years of clinical experience can apply for the prior learning assessment for specific courses in the, the nursing curriculum. Um, I'll give you a few of those for examples. Principles of Baccalaureate Nursing Education, uh, Community as Client, Advanced Health Assessment, and Nursing Informatics are some of the courses. And the expectation is that those individuals having worked, especially in hospital settings, would have had a good bit of training uh, in those areas. So if they have five years or more experience, then they can go through evaluation by one of the faculty assessors in the College of Nursing uh, and can earn credit for those courses. Thank you. And I, I think that that's an important point to extrapolate to other programs, that there is a whole variety of ways in which individuals can earn credit toward a baccalaureate degree. One is the transfer of the ADN program, and another is the uh, prior learning assessment of certain kinds of courses, not every single course that's required for the baccalaureate, but obviously the nursing department has agreed that there are some areas in which prior learning assessment can occur for its students. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, here's another question for you. Uh, are you the faculty unionized? No, we are not, and I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon. Okay. I, I do want to say, though, that currently uh, Kale is working on a project funded by the Ford Foundation with the City University of New York system, and there are four institutions with whom we're working to develop prior learning assessment programs. That faculty is unionized, and they are participating in prior learning assessment. So um, it is that that is not a make or break situation. Faculty and prior learning assessment programs may or may not be unionized. Uh, here's another question, Jerry, um, and um, sort of a political question. If the chair of the program just isn't interested, do they have to assess portfolios? No, that was one of the, the things we determined early on in, in developing this program was that it would be on a volunteer basis and, and almost a bottom-up approach that we, we went through the dean's Council and I talked to the uh, department heads in each of the colleges and we talked to them about prior learning assessment and then asked them to take it to the faculty and we went and visited many of the departments and talked about PLA and it was their choice to either take part or not. Uh, one way that it's been very successful though in, in getting the departments and the programs to be involved is we generally find if there's a student who has a solid background that brings prior learning to the, the institution, we can use that individual's story in persuading the department and particularly some of the faculty members in the department that it's a valid approach to, to use prior learning assessment for credit. One of the things we try and remind them is, have you ever had a course that you taught and you realized at some point in the course that there was a, a student in the class who probably didn't need the course because they already knew the content. Um, now certainly there are some department heads or faculty members who don't have any way of imagining that, but for the most part, uh, I believe the majority of us have had that kind of experience and that's where we are able to sell them. If we bring in an individual that, that has that kind of background in the subject area that they might consider doing PLA. Thank you. And um, I think that your point about convincing people by uh, demonstrating that there are um, students who have learned uh, outside the college classroom and can be successful is a good one. Uh, very often uh, seeing the actual person and knowing the actual person's accomplishments rather than uh, having theory uh, is, is very helpful. Here's another question. Um, is it just one course? 
Uh, in other words, if a student agrees to do this, do they just take um, one course, or are there other courses that follow? Well, that's another good question, and I think different institutions do this in different ways. But at Valdosta State, we have the PLA 2000, which is the portfolio development course. Um, in, in the current situation, I'm the one teaching that. And in that course, we cover uh, a good bit of information about um, self-assessment and career planning and choosing a career that fits with what you want to do in life and the majors and so forth. And, and we teach the students how to develop the portfolio. As a result of that course, they submit one portfolio that is available then to them to submit to a department for consideration um, for credit. After they pass that course, they can continue to submit portfolios for credit uh, in other specific situations with courses. So they're, they're only required to take that course once and then from then on they can do the, the portfolios for other courses. And we continue to offer them guidance on that so it's, um, you know, not that they're, they're pretty much out on their own at that point. But normally, after they've done one portfolio, they generally know how to do it from then on. Thank you. And I, I think that's important that um, after they've done one portfolio, they know how to do it from then on because um, one of the uh, advantages for a faculty member who's the assessor is that that faculty member will know what to expect. There will be um, an ag agreed upon form that the portfolio will follow and uh, students will always submit their portfolio in a specified form so uh, the faculty member will soon be able to go through and, and know what to expect. Um, we have another question. Uh, you award one to four hours at the lower level. Uh, do you also award against specific existing courses? Yes, we actually will grant credit for courses in the lower division, the upper division, and even in the graduate category. Uh, it's not just in the lower level. And the, the transcript actually shows the specific course and designation. So for instance, there's a, a nursing informatics course that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in our catalog, that's nursing 4400. And that is exactly what would show up on the transcript when the student earns credit for that course. So that is that is done so that it is going to be on the transcript and the student takes that with them and, and it designates the exact course. Um, we believe Here. that has a more solid meaning to the student in the long run rather than just a, a number of hours. Jerry, is there any way on the transcript to, that you indicate that this uh, credit was awarded via prior learning assessment? It's in a category that we have coding that is used throughout the university system, what's called K credit, and that can be through testing or through experiential learning. So I believe it's the same that we would have for a student who did CLEP. So if they bring in CLEP credits, I believe those show as K credit. Um, they're pass fail, so that it's it's you know it's not graded with the letter grade of of A, B, C, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the the K credit is pretty much used in the university system that way for anything by testing or through experiential learning. Thank you. But there is a course equivalent also listed on the transcript. Correct. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think those are all the questions, Jerry, for now. Very good. I'm sure there will be more later. I think so. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very informative and helpful presentation. And it was uh, good to hear what a state university does with prior learning assessment, uh, especially in a program that's fairly new. And now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Susan Gunn, who will talk about um, the PLA program at St. Edwards University. Susan? Thank you, Judy. Can, anyone, can everyone hear me all right? I yes, I believe so. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, St. Edwards University is 
rather different from, um, whoops, what did I do? I think I went to the wrong place here. So sorry, we're just going to have to scoot through here to get back to where we were. I've got my slides in the wrong order. I don't know what the po folks on the screen are seeing, but I um, here we are. Okay. Um, St. Edward's University is very different from Valdosta State in that we are a private university, and um, that, and we're also quite a bit smaller. We're we're just one one little institution. We don't have a, a region or or a chain of institutions that we belong to. And um, the other thing that's different about us is that we've been doing this since the mid 1970s. I went through the program myself 25 years ago, <laughs> and it's it's changed some, but but not all that much. Um, the slides that I'm going to show you today are um, adapted somewhat from a program that I use when I'm presenting an information session to students who might be interested in portfolio. These may be in, uh, currently enrolled students. They may be people considering applying for admission. But I call that little program portfolio in a nutshell. And so when you see some of these slides, bear in mind some of these are written from the student perspective. Um, basically, here's a word about St. Edward's. We are a small university of just about 5,500 altogether, private, affiliated with the Catholic Church, although you don't have to be Catholic to attend here and certainly not to teach here, as I am not. Um, it's a not-for-profit university, and we are known primarily as a liberal arts institution, although that's certainly branching out quite a bit. We are located in Austin, Texas, and I have here in this urban area a very wide variety of other institutions of higher learning, a fine community college, the University of Texas, um, Houston Tillotson, which is a historically black university, and several others from which I can pull assessors. So, and in addition to our own faculty. So I'm really very fortunate in that regard as the program director. Our degree completion program is called New College. And as of the current academic year, we had 858 students enrolled. Most of them are part time, as you might imagine. New College takes up about 15 and a half going on 16% of the student body. The average age is close to 36. And of the incoming classes, um, about a third of the students who come in in any given year will participate in portfolio assessment. Almost everyone brings in some transfer credit. About a third take CLEP also. So. Um, Prior, the portfolio program, as unique as it is, um, is only affecting about a third of our new college students right now. I wish it were more. It should be more. We define portfolio as a noun, both as a process and a body of work. And we also hear, <laughs> hear it used as a verb, as in, I, uh, I want to portfolio some of the classes in my major. I see a question um, over in the um, in the discussion section that that someone is having difficulty. Is anyone else having difficulty? Let me know, and we'll jump in and see if we can correct it. Okay, at St. Edwards, we use a flexible course match model. Okay, what that means is that. We first have our students look at the um, bulletins in New College and the traditional undergrad bulletin, and we use both of these. We have special topics course numbers, however, for unique content that may not fit existing course titles. And when, uh, when applicable, we use courses from other regionally accredited institutions. So. Those are the three types of courses that we will work with the student to find a match 
for their prior learning. They're required to take the PLA seminar, which currently is a one-hour course, and of course students have to be admitted to New College and take a preliminary course as well called Critical Thinking. Um, once they get through the PLA seminar, there is a change that we've just affected. This is very different from what you're going to see in the book. And I want to tell you a little bit why we've instituted this marker course called Portfolio Advising. It has yet to be approved by Academic Council, although it's been through faculty, the school committee, and the curriculum committee. I think one more committee meeting should do it. But um, if this is approved, this is the program that's going into effect in the fall. What we had happening was that people would come through the PLA seminar and then they are sort of disappearing into the system and we didn't have an effective way to follow them. We found, uh, or we, we considered this program for about five years. We've been working on this for a long time and decided that if students were required to register for a marker course, we would have a way of communicating with them all everyone who's working on a portfolio at any given time, and uh, tracking progress, helping people who are in trouble, intervening before this problem becomes intractable. The other thing that this marker course does for us is that it helps us to align our fee structure more with CALE Standard 8, which you'll see in the Assessing Learning book. I'll talk more about that as we get further down the program. But for now, um, I want just want you to know that first they take a PLA seminar and then to retain access to a mentor, portfolio advisor, and to be qualified to submit a portfolio, they do have to register for this subsequent non-credit course. Okay. The, port, the Center for Prior Learning Assessment, which I direct, um, is the one-stop shop for all portfolio matters in New College. And we think, we'll know for sure once we get this marker course system started, but we think we're serving about 80 to 100 stu students who are at various stages in the portfolio process uh, per trimester. We, we have summer, fall, and spring operations all year round. We have new college faculty on contract to teach the seminar and provide portfolio advising. And you'll see this much more clearly when the, um, when the slides reach you. We use assessors from within contract faculty in new college or the university at large. Occasionally we'll have to go outside, but that doesn't happen very often. And all of our practices that we do here in regard to portfolio assessment in New College follow CALE guidelines. That's our holy Bible as far as uh, the practice of prior learning assessment goes. We ask our students who come in uh, and who are contemplating portfolio to think about their learning in terms of what do they know, how well do they know it, what can they do with the knowledge? That's the applied piece. You notice we've got theory and application there. And finally, what evidence can I produce to show that I know it? How are you going to document it, in other words? We define college-level learning um, according to CALE standards pretty closely. Usually it's required after high school. Not always. In the case of our ballet Austin dancers, who um, have a, speci a specific degree program that folds in their, their stage work in dance. Some of those people have been dancing professionally since age 15. So there's some flexibility with that. But for the average person, it's usually acquired after high school. Uh, college level learning is compatible with broad subject matter areas or specific courses in a college curriculum. It's likely to include both theory and practice. And of course, it's the most important thing, the one that we absolutely cannot bend on, is that 
the learning has to be transferable to contexts and settings outside the situation where the original learning took place. Uh, we let the students know that just exactly what they're going to have to do. And it begins with a complete adult learning history, an inventory and self-assessment. They have to identify college level learning in their histories and see if that might fit in their degree plan. If it doesn't fit in a degree plan, there's no point in doing the portfolio on that particular learning. They also need to be able to bring this learning, this, this knowledge that they know so deeply that they do it practically on automatic pilot into language. And we, because I'm, I'm an English professor, so I'm inclined to describe that in terms of rhetorical tasks, narration, description, explanation, persuasion, and always being mindful of the audience purpose and context. Because of my disciplinary background, that's, um, that's something that I stress. Not all programs may do that. But for me, the rhetorical task and the, and the rhetorical context are extremely important. We also, again, following a kind of comp college composition model, we begin in writing short sentences, moving to paragraphs, and finally to the essay level about learning what we know, how we learned it, and what we can do with it. And if the articulation portion is the telling, the showing is probably as important, if not more important, and that's where we get to documentation, collecting and evaluating the evidence you have of this learning, and constructing evidence or reconstructing when that's necessary. Finally, we get to the display situation, and that's where the electronic portfolio comes in. In my, in my day, when I was a student, we were endlessly stuffing sheets of paper into plastic sheet protectors and assembling binders and doing all of that stuff. We don't have to do all that work. We don't get as many paper cuts now with the electronic portfolio, but the process is no less rigorous. And we insist on professionalism both in content and in presentation. This, these are the three main sections of our portfolio. Uh, we start by preparing in the data bank. We do the chronological record first, situation forms. This, notice that this echoes back to the areas of learning that Diana spoke about in her presentation. It doesn't just happen at work. It can happen anywhere. And we tie all that together with an autobiographical essay. And then we work on the course petition, the model course petition, like in Jerry's program. We have them create a sample portfolio that they can use as a model for subsequent submissions and then Finally, the summary sheet, which goes to the registrar for posting credit. You can look at all of this um, in detail when you get your own copies of the slides. OK. Students want to know what they have to do to qualify to do this. And very often, we'll get students in the admission process who are really euphoric about this. They envision themselves coming in and earning 100 hours of credit. And Theoretically, that's possible, but in actual practice, that really doesn't happen very often. The students need to start thinking about this in a very um, deliberate and careful way fairly early on. And so there is a prerequisite course that all new college students have to take. Once they've completed that, and we're, we're fairly certain by the time they get through this course that they're ready for college level writing and critical thinking, the kind of thinking they're going to have to do to step back from their own learning and take an objective distance from it. Um, we then ask them to complete this prior learning seminar, which presently is a one-hour course. And then finally, enroll in portfolio advising for subsequent portfolio work outside that semester where they take the PLA seminar. They want to know what they're going to get for their money <laughs> when they enroll in this course. And 
this gives you kind of an idea of how we structure the course as well and, and how students spend their time. We spend a lot of time, 40% of the course, and it's a seven-week, one-hour course, working on this adult learning inventory. For many students, it's the most valuable part. It was for me. Even though I earned 30 hours for my portfolio when I did it 25 years ago, that almost seemed like icing on the cake after going through the self-evaluative process of assembling this adult learning history. They draft a comprehensive portfolio uh, plan, which of course gets revised again and again as they continue through the process. Um, prepare the sample course petition, and then we spend a little time learning to navigate the ePortfolio software and gaining proficiency in working with it. That's what they get for their tuition dollar when they take the PLA seminar. Now, for portfolio advising, um, because it's a zero credit course and they have to pay $300 to get in it, they're certainly wondering what they're going to get for that. It gives access to the uh, portfolio advising services available in the Center for Prior Learning Assessment. You can't submit a portfolio if you're not enrolled in this course. However, it also maintains access to other university services, and this is important because if you stop out for a semester to work on nothing but portfolio, you need access to the library, you need access to the online writing lab, technical support, all of these university services. And being enrolled in this course, even though it's a zero credit course, maintains access. Now that's something that may be unique to our university that we just, you know, throw people <laughs> out of the system if they're not enrolled in something, but this is one way of getting past that issue. Now here's what's in it for the student. The $300 course fee covers assessments for any and all portfolio work that they may complete during that semester. If they get one portfolio petition done, say for three hours, they pay $300. If they get five courses done, they work hard, they're real, ambition, real ambitious, the same $300 pays for the assessments for all five of those courses. Is that a money-losing proposition for us? We don't think it's going to be. Our dean um, looked at the average awards and the fees that students paid and the assessment fees going out and figured that if they, if they stick to that average, it's going to be pretty much of a wash. But it does give students the opportunity to um, make the affordability issue a little bit more favorable to them. If we were a public university and if our tuition were in the vicinity of $200 a credit hour, I might not be so um, committed to this flat fee for a whole semester portfolio assessment. But when your tuition is what ours is, 600 I believe in the last bulletin it was $653 a credit hour, then the affordability issue looms very large. That is a problem for private universities. And uh, so the, the students, have an opportunity to mitigate that cost by maximizing their use of portfolio assessment. It's repeated, now the portfolio advising course is repeatable three times within the first year, and of course it's with my discretion. There's a separate section, 1049, which um, I'm a little bit pickier about because these will be students who stopped out, dropped out, had some sort of interruption in their progress at St. Edward's or they're otherwise outside that one year limit. And it means they can get back in, but they're going to have to talk to me and convince me that, that, they're, that they have a plan that they can do. We grade this course either S for submission or NS for no submission. And because if people aren't diligent about taking the portfolio seriously, we're not going to keep taking their money. So two, 
two no submissions. In other words, you you enroll in the course, pay three hundred dollars, and don't accomplish anything. We're going to let you do that twice, and then after that, you may no longer participate. I'm going to move on here just real quickly. This is basically what portfolio is going to cost. They pay one hour for the PLA seminar at the current tuition rate, the software license, which is negligible, but it's there, and then the enrollment fee for portfolio advising, 300 per semester. Number three is the one variable here. You can control this. If you, the harder you work, the less times you're going to have to repeat that portfolio advising course and thereby reduce the cost of the portfolio. Here are some facts I do want you to know about our program. Here at St. Edwards, portfolio hours do count toward the residency requirement. They are graded credit or no credit. You, the grades, um, so it's like Jerry's pass-fail option at Valdosta. We, they don't get a letter grade. You can use portfolio hours to meet degree, degree requirements in any area except the mission sequence. That's a special sequence of courses unique probably to St. Edward. And uh, there are a few specific courses that aren't allowed. So. For example, the, the strategic man what is that? Strategic management in the School of Business. The School of Business does not want that course done by portfolio, so we don't do it. And students need to be consulting a portfolio advisor before they start working. Finally, we want students to utilize other methods of prior learning assessment, such as credit by exam, pre-evaluated learning like ACE. Um, and transfer credit from other institutions. And I want to say, too, that if a good CLEP exists or so, there's some other mode of getting this credit on your transcript, we're going to encourage the student to utilize that. For example, Principles of Management is a course that people often come in thinking they're going to portfolio. And my response to that would be, why would you do that when there's an excellent CLEP for that? So that, that's how we work it here at, at St. Edwards. And uh, I think this is a good time to pause for questions. OK. Um, Susan, thank you very much. Uh, th this is Judy. And um, I before I um, open the um, emails for questions, I, I would just like to say that what you presented and what Jerry presented are um, observations and facts that make me very happy because they confirmed what I said originally, that we did see a lot of diversity in how institutions approach prior learning assessment. We saw a large state university. We saw a small Catholic college. We saw one in which there are specific course matches, one in which the course may be a course not taught at the institution, but taught at another regionally accredited institution. We saw one institution where faculty evaluators from the institution did the assessment, another where there could be um, outside faculty members to do the assessment. We saw one institution where there is a preparatory course and then a portfolio submission, and another institution where there is not only the preparatory course, but there is also another course that students need to register for. And I think on and on and on we could see differences, as well as similarities. Uh, faculty do the assessment. There is a course to prepare students. The process is clear and available to students. There's rigor in the assessment. And in both cases, preparing uh, for prior learning assessment in any of its forms can be a transformative experience for the student. So thank you both very, very much. Uh, Susan, we do have a question. Um, 
And I think that I'm going to ask uh, you to answer and then to ask Jerry to answer also, because I don't think we dealt with this with Valdosta State University. What's the total number of credits that are allowed through prior learning assessment? Well, um, at St. Edwards, there is no arbitrary limit. However, there may be some functional limits. For example, if the course is not fitting in a degree plan anywhere, there's no point in doing it. Let's just say, for example, that a student has vast understanding of um, kinesiology or physical education courses, but they've used up all their electives and they're a business major. Okay, we're not going to be able to fit that in anywhere except electives in that major. So my advice to that student would be don't do all that work because we, we can't use it. And I would not only not encourage it, I would refuse to accept it because we'd be just taking their money for no good purpose. Um, again, the, there's a, there are the mission courses which have to be done at St. Edward's. There are some specific courses that cannot be done by portfolio because of departmental um, concerns or restrictions. And whether I agree with those or not, I have to accept them or re at least respect them. So um, again, we don't put a cap on it. I've seen some huge portfolios come through. One of the most recent ones was a guy who requested, I believe, 50 hours at one time. He got 44 of them. He didn't get everything he asked for, but which is all right by me. But um, we didn't say, oh, you can only do so much and no more. If, if you have the learning and you can express it in language and if you can give evidence of it then, and it fits in your degree plan, we will consider it. Thank you. Thanks. Jerry, uh, is there a limit at Valdosta State? Judy, there is, and I was thinking about that when, when I saw the question pop up, that that wasn't something I thought to mention in the, the earlier slides, but we have a 30-hour limit. Um, and as we're interpreting that, that's for the portfolio process. Um, it may vary depending on the program. There are some degree programs that they will not allow that many credits, but um, overall institution-wide, that is the, the limit. Um, we have some people, and, and I guess I'm going to go back to the nursing example, where the credits that they transfer from the technical college or the community college that are brought in under the nursing program, there is a statewide articulation agreement on that to where we take some of those courses uh, and count them automatically. And some people might interpret that as prior learning assessment, but we're not counting that toward the 30 hours. So they can do 30 hours um, with PLA if, if they match up the courses correctly. And when you say 30 hours with PLA, you're only talking about portfolio. So um, are there additional hours that people can earn through CLEP exams, for example? CLEP, as we're interpreting it right now, that would be a separate situation. Um, I think when we first started doing the PLA, we were saying that everything would be the, the 30 hours. It would include CLEP and ACE, but um, I believe we've we've gotten people persuaded that there's probably a lot more room for flexibility with what we're doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question um, uh, relates to Ivy Tech in Indiana where they only allow PLA for program courses, general education must be done through testing. And um, do you have any kinds of parameters for what you will accept uh, and what you won't? Susan? Well, I'd love to speak to that because I have a young man right now in the PLA course that I'm teaching this half of the semester. He was born in Turkey, served in the Turkish Army, migrated to the United States, and our general ed requirements happen to have a global perspectives class, okay? What he's going to do is a special topics course called Culture of Turkey. <laughs> and he's doing it, you know, for an American-born student, this would be the equivalent of a living abroad experience. 
he's coming at it from the other way. His living abroad experience is living here, and he's writing about the uh, culture of Turkey from a perspective of someone born in that country and how people in the United States have received him and what he observes about our understandings about Turkey. He's very articulate. Uh, he has ample evidence. I have no doubt that he's going to earn that credit. But because global perspective is a general education requirement here at St. Edwards, and there isn't really an equivalent um, exam for that. So that's an example of, of where portfolio assessment uh, can come in, even in the general ed requirement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, do you have any um, uh, practices that would apply PLA to one area but not another? Uh, we do allow PLA in the core, and I think the example that Susan gave is close to one that we do. We have courses that we call Area B in the core that are intended to be um, integrative of different degree programs or, or subject areas. Those are called perspectives courses, and we have four of those that are available for prior learning assessment. We actually have a good number of students who've done perspectives courses uh, through prior learning assessment by portfolio. So that is an area that's available. The remainder of the subject areas are predominantly within majors. Um, so it varies. We can, we can do them either way. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you who are reading along with us uh, with regard to the questions, we do have a suggestion um, with regard to financing um, that says that scholarship funds can help support students who can't pay for um, some of the coursework. And I would like to refer you when you get a chance to that Adult Learning and Focus uh, publication, that 2008 publication that I mentioned earlier. There we show um, a chart of the states that award uh, state financial aid to students who are taking less than a half-time load. And as we know, many of our adult learners do not enroll in six credit hours or more each semester. There are a good number of states that do not award financial aid to students taking fewer than six credit hours. So that it's altogether possible that an adult student taking um, the prior learning assessment course, for example, and only that course would not be eligible for state financial aid, not eligible for federal financial aid. There are many institutions, therefore, that have private scholarships that they have um, generated um, by approaching local donors. And uh, that is possible uh, to be used to help adults who are otherwise ineligible for financial aid. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, okay, there's another um, question that uh, gets to what some of us see as uh, the heart of making prior learning assessment successful at an institution. Uh, Susan and Jerry, does either one of you have a marketing budget to promote your programs? And I would like to say, that promoting prior learning assessment programs often involves promoting the programs within the institution to faculty, administrators, staff, and students, as well as outside the institution. Um, Susan, do you have a marketing budget? Oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> actually, from what I, I have been able to learn from our admission staff and what they tell me, most of the knowledge that students coming in who are seeking admission to the university, um, most of what they know about portfolio assessment comes by word of mouth. They know somebody at work who went through the program or they've heard about it some other way. One of the problems um, of being in an institution is that Oh, I don't know quite how to say this tactfully. Um, different priorities may exist in the institution, and the adult students aren't always at the top of that priority list. And so you find yourself having to be very creative in, in the ways that you get word out. It can be done, but it can be also very discouraging. And 
So we really count seriously on, on our our graduates and our alumni to get the word out. Okay, thank you. Jerry, do you have a special marketing budget? Well, that I would definitely agree with Susan on that one, and that that's, that's a tough one. We do not have a marketing budget, and what we've done is primarily uh, within the institution, we have an email list that we send uh, generally every semester an email to all the students who are 25 and older uh, promoting the idea that they can come to us for the uh, portfolio evaluation process and, and earn credit that way. Uh, the majority of the students I see come through referrals from either a faculty member who's their advisor or a teacher and recognizes that they are adult learners who have valid prior learning that can be transcripted in some way. So uh, that's usually the way we find out about them. Okay, thank you. Talking about valid prior learning um, experiences that can be evaluated and subsequently transcripted, I'd like to ask both of you to respond to the question of people who come to your institution who are serving or have served in the military. Jerry, when you gave your introduction and you talked about the uh, location of Valdosta State University. You mentioned several military bases that are close by, and I wonder how you work with students there and um, how they are able to use their prior learning. We've been doing the transcription through the American Council on Education uh, interpretation of military training for a good while, so that is a, a real solid part of our prior learning assessment program, that, that's been around a lot longer than our portfolio approach has been. So when I meet with students and, and I go through a series of questions, one of the first things I ask them is if they have military training and, and look at their documentation. Um, that's a pretty straightforward approach and we've been very successful with that. Um, I will say it's an ongoing effort in making the department heads and the faculty aware of, of how that works. In fact, we had the um, workshop recently on our campus about both CLEP and ACE credits uh, to inform faculty and, and others about how that works. So we're, we're trying to spread that word. It is something that's dependent on the specific department or program to decide how that credit will depend, will work towards a degree. So that's sort of like what Susan said earlier. In, in some colleges or majors, the, the credits may not match up uh, or they may not need the kind of credit that, that we have from the, the ACE transcripts. But um, in general, we do use those and we encourage the students to bring those in. Thank you. Susan, do you do anything special with the military? Oh, absolutely. Um, we do the very same thing that Jerry does. We we rely heavily on the uh, on the ACE transcripts for military credit, and by the time I get them in the Center for Prior Learning Assessment, their advisors usually their academic advisors usually have taken care of getting all of that transferred. That's uh, embedded in the admission process for new college and. Um, I'm real happy about that. Also, um, we were very fortunate to snag um, a young woman from who'd worked for the VA before, and we hired her in, <laughs> in, in the financial aid office. So she is familiar inside and out with VA benefits, and she, uh, she's been a tremendous help in getting our veterans all of the financial assistance to which they're entitled. Oh, thank you. That, so your answer addresses not only providing prior learning assessment credit for the military, but also how to help with making um, college affordable for them. Thank you. That, that, that's a big help. Um, I have a, a question. You, you talked about transferring in credit uh, and uh, articulation agreements. What do you do about transferring in prior learning assessment from other institutions? Are there, for example, people who might bring portfolio assessments from other institutions, and how would that transfer to your institution? Uh, Jerry, could I ask you first, please? 
Certainly, Judy. That's one of the reasons that we have established the uh, Adult Learning Consortium in the university system is to facilitate that type of transfer within our system. And we have an agreement that the institutions each have to sign when they join the consortium that if um, a student earns credit through portfolio or other uh, established methods in this program from one institution, those will automatically be transcribed at the, the other participating institutions. And we've actually extended that recently to uh, cover the ACE and CLEP types of credit so that if a student comes into one of our two-year institutions and they have uh, CLEP and ACE credits, they can be transcribed there. And our registrar will honor those without requiring the student to submit the transcripts again. But we, we anticipate having situations in which there might be a faculty assessor at another institution who would have the ability to evaluate a student in a course that we might not be able to do through PLA. And so we set up an assessor's network within the Adult Learning Consortium and we'll be allowing students to do those uh, evaluations online. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Susan, how about St. Edwards? Well, we're not part of a consortium, as you know, but every now and then we do get uh, a, a student transferring to us from another college or university um, that brings in portfolio assessment from that institution. And uh, when we were doing our participation in the recent massive kale study, the yes. I was surprised at how many of those we had within just that very narrow window of, uh, of time that we were examining. Within one year, I think we had three different students who brought in assess uh, portfolio assessment from other places. I really ask the first question, and it's the most important question I ask when I get one of those, is are they CALE members and do they do their assessments according to CALE standards? If they do, it's a no-brainer for me. They, the credit comes in because I know what the standards are and I know that if they are members of CALE and if they're following the CALE principles and guidelines, that that assessment is going to be grounded and solid. Um, if they're not, I don't know that I've ever had one that wasn't, but then I'd have to ask more questions before we would allow that credit to transfer. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for, for your answers. Um, as we mentioned, we do have homework assignments. Jerry began uh, and uh, gave you his. He's going to repeat it. But first, I'm going to ask Susan to give her assignment for the next time. Remember, it's February 22nd, Tuesday. Susan? Thank you, Judy. The first thing I'd like you to do, which isn't on the slide, is to look at our chapter in the book that you'll be receiving, which begins on page 67. Um, the story of St. Edward's University and the way we do PLA, bearing in mind that the model that is shown here in the slides is a little bit different from the model in the book. Um, what I'd like you to do with relation to the slide, we're on slide 68, I believe, is to consider one case study. We have a student named Andrea who wants to prepare a portfolio, and she's asking for a total of 12 hours credit. So we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis here and determine whether this is a good deal for her. Slide number 69 um, shows what her expenses will be. And now, once having made note of those expenses, I've got a few questions for you. I'd like you to identify or to compute the cost for these 12 hours if she were going to take these in the classroom. That's your, you know, top dollar sticker price. And then I'd like you to compute the cost of her portfolio if she can if she finishes it in three semesters. In other words, she takes the full calendar year that she has available to do that. I'd also like you to compute the cost of the portfolio if she's able to finish it in only one semester. 
And an interesting question is, if we were to make the portfolio seminar, the PLAS 1132, a three-hour course instead of a one-hour course, would she still find that portfolio has a cost savings for her? Uh, finally, I'd like you to think about what obstacles you might encounter implementing a similar fee structure at your college or university because obviously a fee structure like this isn't going to be workable for everyone. Um, this fee structure is, is, is helpful to us because our tuition costs are so high. But if your tuition costs at your university are lower, for example, the, the benefit might be different. So I want you to think about this in the context of your university. Obviously, what's good for one school is not good for another. And so you, you always, when you get some information like this, need to be looking at how does this apply to me or does it at all. Then if you have other questions, comments, or concerns, I'd like you to write them down and we can talk about them. And that's all I have to say. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. And now to review, Jerry had an assignment for you also. Jerry? Yes, I ask that you review the chapter on VSU, look at the two sample portfolios, and the suggestion is that you determine whether you would give credit to the students who submitted those portfolios, and then bring any other questions or feedback with you when we meet next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you both once again for a really terrific session with a lot of important information. We do have some questions that we have not answered today. I do want to say we're lucky. We have a chance to answer those questions next week, and we shall. In the meantime, while this is still fresh in your minds, if you do have additional questions that occur to you, please, before Friday at the close of business, write those questions to me, J-W-E-R-T-H-E-I-M at kale.org, and um, I will be happy to bring them up when we meet again. I look forward to meeting all of you again next week to continuing the conversation with Diana, with Susan, with Jerry, and with me, and to hearing your additional questions. Thanks very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.